For our first webinar in our series, I'll present Dr. Luke Tomich, who is the Director of the Pediatric Epilepsy Surgery Program at Hackensack Sansari Children's Hospital in New Jersey. And he's going to talk about epilepsy surgery and the scandal, that's a really strong word, but I, I like it, the scandal of underutilization. Welcome, Dr. Tomich. Well, thanks so much for this invitation to speak. I think this is a tremendously important uh, webinar to bring light to some of these issues, and uh, I look forward to talking about it. Again, just to uh, reintroduce myself a little bit, I work in New Jersey, mostly at uh, Hackensack uh, Sansari Children's Hospital, and uh, we, we work in a multi-specialty group, um, and, and I have a special clinical and research interest in epilepsy. Great. So in terms of conflicts of interest, I recently served as a clinical consultant for Philips Electric Source Imaging Technology. Thank you. So I think it's important to start with uh, some big take home points and then we'll start nailing down on the underutilization problem and why I think it's uh, uh, occurring and how we can maybe combat it. So epilepsy, as many of you already know, is a common neurologic ailment. Uh, with a tremendous global impact, and it leads to significant suffering uh, for our patients who have it, as well as significant healthcare costs. Um, for over one third of those afflicted, medical therapy does not afford good control of seizures. We call these patients drug resistant or medically resistant epilepsy. And early surgical referral is recommended, uh, but unfortunately, many times uh, these patients do not get referred to surgery. And again, we're gonna talk about some of the reasons why. Repeated seizure activity, and in some circumstances, the medicines used to control seizures can be damaging, especially to the developing brain, and can lead to impaired cognitive and psychosocial development. So that's, again, another reason why we wanna consider surgery as a treatment option early when it's appropriate. While no drug developed in the last three decades has had an impact on the incidence of drug-resistant epilepsy, there are now three separate randomized controlled trials in experience with tens of thousands of patients that show that surgery is both safe and can be highly effective uh, for well-selected patients. And I'll finish with this take-home point, and, and again, um, I put myself in this category of the community caring for patients with drug-resistant epilepsy. Uh, when I say that, I really feel that we have failed our patients and we failed to develop systems that promptly and consistently identify patients who might benefit from existing technologies. Uh, and mainly I'm talking here about surgical technologies. It's definitely fractured and it, the, the regional differences to me are pretty astounding that it, it can even, you could have a delay to surgery if you live in the wrong part of a big urban center. There are some parts of, of Los Angeles, if you get referred to one hospital, you'll probably get to surgery quicker than you would at another hospital in another neighborhood of Los Angeles. So this is, I would have to agree with that, that the system is broken, that's for sure. You're right, and, and the variability in treatment is one thing that we're trying to um, fight back against a little bit. I always say if you have chest pain and you show up at almost any emergency department in the United States, you're going to get relatively standardized treatment. Now, epilepsy is certainly much more complex than uh, chest pain. But again, I think if we pick epilepsy into its component parts and try to rely more on guidelines and algorithms, we can really hold to account uh, the community of physicians taking care of epilepsy patients and raise the bar. <laughs> So about 15 years ago, uh, both the American Epilepsy Society, uh, AANS, Neurosurgery Society, and the Neurology Society put forward a joint statement recommending early surgical referral for any patient with what we call drug-resistant epilepsy, which I'll define in the next slide. And what we recognized is beyond just freedom from seizures, a number of studies documented improvement in cognition, improvement in quality of life, and often improvement in a lot of the uh, comorbidity problems that come along with epilepsy, whether that be depression, anxiety, or behavioral problems. But despite this recommendation, uh, a population-based study showed that there really hadn't been any increase in epilepsy surgery over a 30-year period starting in 1990. 
And what we know is that surgery continues to be profoundly, profoundly underutilized. In fact, I would argue that it might be one of the most dramatic examples of underutilization in medicine today. Uh, the average time elapsed in the United States between seizure onset and surgery can be as long as 20 years. And that's in the United States. So that number is probably even higher in um, some middle and low income countries. I think a paper was just published uh, uh, that looked at some numbers more recently through um, I think 2015 through 2018 and the, and the percentage had increased by a tiny bit in the US for pediatrics. I mean, almost negligible. So it's increasing, but just barely. We're not really making a dent in it at all. Right. I think, again, I'm, I'm hoping that recent years there has been some progress, but it still probably pales in comparison with what we need. Sure. Um, just at the last American Epilepsy Society meeting in DC, there were two or three podium uh, speakers who called the underutilization of surgery for epilepsy a national disaster. And indeed, from this reference, we can see that uh, estimates vary, but probably less than 1%, or if it's higher than 1%, it's a single digit percentage of potential surgical candidates with drug resistant epilepsy are receiving operations. It's certainly much, much lower than it should be. And again, this is a problem that is not a new problem. It's something that we've been talking about for decades. Um, so I think one big message that I want to make today to, you know, patients with epilepsy or families of patients with epilepsy is to empower you um, to, to, you know, to really take uh, matters into your own hands a little bit to understand that, that this is a problem and to you know, they have now online tools to gauge the appropriateness of a surgical evaluation for epilepsy and a number of other online resources. And I think, you know, we, uh, um, those, those with epilepsy really have to become savvy consumers in, in this climate. We're trying to educate them in this webinar is exactly one of the things we're doing. So thank you. Absolutely. So this is, um, uh, you know, being confronted with this underutilization problem, we recently did a review for epilepsy where we looked at all of the articles. Uh, I think we reviewed over 500 full text articles that uh, grappled with the question of underutilization. And what we identified was uh, six main themes that continue to crop up um, in terms of why we had this, this treatment gap. Uh, one of the main themes and probably the most important theme was a knowledge gap. And that's a knowledge gap among both neurologists and neurosurgeons taking care of patients who have drug refractory epilepsy. Uh, there was a lack of coordination of care. Um, there was an issue of patient and family perspectives about epilepsy surgery. Uh, there was social and socioeconomic uh, and racial barriers. Uh, the issue of the complexity of the preoperative workup and research funding. And I'm going to go through each of these in more detail. So when it comes to the knowledge gap, you know, there was a New England Journal article in 2000 that gave us a good definition for drug resistant epilepsy. Because we have so many anti-epileptic drugs, um, it wasn't clear how many you had to try before you came to the conclusion that uh, a child or an adult is what we call drug resistant. But after that 2000 New England Journal article, we saw that after trying two appropriate anti-epileptic drugs in monotherapy, if the patient fails both of those, the chance of becoming seizure-free with the trial of the third medicine is less than 5%. Yeah. So again, it's quite well established at this point that the failure of two medicines makes a patient drug resistant or medically resistant, medically refractory. And at that point, uh, both the American Academy of Neurology and the International League Against Epilepsy recommend surgical referral. But not enough patients are referred. And looking at many different surveys, there were a lot of reasons that neurologists gave for non-referral. One of them is that um, drug-resistant epilepsy was being misdefined uh, or incorrectly defined. In other words, when neurologists were asked how do you define drug-resistant epilepsy? Many of them were not uh, defining it correctly. Uh, some even defined it as the failure of all 
existing drugs or the failure of all existing drugs and the failure of vagal nerve stimulation, which is clearly not correct. It's the failure of two drugs tried in monotherapy at appropriate doses. And by so again, monotherapy, you mean um, one at a time. Sorry, go ahead. Monotherapy means one at a time. That's exactly right. Yeah. Okay. So again, I think um, misdefining uh, drug resistant epilepsy is important because nobody is going to be referred to a surgeon until they're uh, classified as drug resistant. And so that's really the gateway. Uh, for a surgical referral. And if many of our neurologists are not identifying drug resistant epilepsy, well, that's obviously a problem. The other reason cited for non-referral was the presence of generalized epilepsy. I can tell you just last month, I operated on a child who had um, infantile spasms, which is a type of generalized epilepsy. Um, and it is a known phenomenon, especially in the pediatric population, that a generalized signature on the EEG does not necessarily mean that there can't be a curative uh, surgery, uh, a focal resection that can help that patient. And so generalized epilepsy should, uh, beyond that, we know that things like vagal nerve stimulation, uh, in some cases, um, callosotomy, um, there, there are certainly surgical options for patients with refractory generalized epilepsy. Um, Another reason for non-referral was seizure focus in the eloquent cortex. So what? eloquent cortex being eloquent cortex. Yeah. So eloquent cortex being cortex that is parts of the brain that are responsible for speech or for movement or let's say for vision, but really speech and movement are the uh, are the two that we think about most. However, we know that we do have surgical options for patients who have eloquent cortex epilepsy. Um, whether that be multiple subpeel transections or uh, reactive neurostimulation like neuropace or deep brain stimulation or vagal nerve stimulation. So there's a number of options for patients who have eloquent cortex epilepsy. Beyond that, I would say that um, many of these patients probably deserve an intracranial EEG survey to make sure that the epilepsy is indeed an eloquent cortex because uh, what's a more common scenario is for epilepsy to be near eloquent cortex or adjacent to it, but not directly in it. Mm -hmm. Low seizure burden is often cited as a reason for non-referral, even though we have ample data that tells us that even patients with, let's say, one or two disabling seizures a year, they still have significant impairment in quality of life, inability to get a driver's license, lower employment, um, and, and a number of different factors where seizure freedom does improve quality of life and also decreases the chance of uh, what we call SUDEP or sudden unexplained death from epilepsy. Another reason for non-referral is a normal MRI, but we certainly know that patients with normal MRIs can go on to get uh, successful surgery. A normal MRI just simply means that we have to look harder. Um, a few weeks ago, I operated on a young child with a completely normal three Tesla MRI because her PET scan showed an area of hypometabolism that corresponded with EEG findings and corresponded with her seizure semiology or the way her seizure clinically looks. And, and she's been seizure free after having daily seizures. Now this is just a month out, but, but again, it's quite encouraging. And certainly we can operate on these patients with a normal MRI. It just means we have to look harder. Um, I go to epilepsy conferences all over New Jersey, and one of the common reasons I see epileptologists wanting to um, not move forward with surgery is because of bilateral findings on EEG. Again, that is not a reason uh, to um, basically uh, uh, refuse or deny surgery for patients who are otherwise good candidates. And we certainly see, especially in the um, hemispherotomy population, you can see bilateral, ictal, and interictal EEG findings. You can even see falsely lateralized ictal and interictal EEG findings. In other words, the seizures seem to start on the normal hemisphere when the other hemisphere looks at normal and damaged. And that is not a contraindication of proceeding in surgery, um, proceeding with surgery. So uh, all these things need to be considered. Finally. Low IQ and psychiatric issues have been uh, reasons cited for non-referral. 
but but again, there's uh, uh, ample data in the literature suggesting that these are not appropriate reasons to um, uh, refuse uh, otherwise appropriate surgery. So looking at, um, there was a survey of six different epilepsy centers across the country looking at hundreds of patients who went on to get surgery. And instead of two medicines, what they found is that an average of five medicines were tried before surgical referral and sometimes up to 14 medicines. Yeah. So again, this should, you know, it's an, it's an appalling, um, uh, I would say, um, divergence from what the clinical guidelines are. And it's something that the more we educate our patients and families about epilepsy, you know, by the time we get to medicine number three, families and patients should start to say, hey, what else is out there? The process has to start. We have a family who's uh, three or four, no, excuse me, one-year-old son just had surgery and mom was told he had to fail all known anti-epileptic drugs before a referral would be made. And we were able to expedite a referral after failure of eight. Um, but it wasn't with the neurologist wasn't on board. The family had to had to go elsewhere. But I was just really surprised because it's 2021 and a physician told mother, no, you have to fail every single known drug before we'll refer you out. It was really surprising. Yeah, uh, it's frustrating to hear that, but I hate to say that is not an uh, uncommon story. We, you know, we've heard stories like that here in New Jersey of neurologists who, you know, are proud of the fact that they haven't referred someone to surgery in the last 20 years. And again, I, I, you know, as somebody who does surgery for epilepsy and sees uh, the great results we can achieve, I see that as a big disservice to our patients. Yeah. Um, another 30% of neurologists in one survey, a uh, recent survey, said that surgery should be considered as a treatment of last resort. And again, I, you know, I do not think that this is, uh, I think most doctors want to do, uh, want to do what's best for their patients and are trying to do what's best for their patients. And again, I think that's why we've referred this to a knowledge, to this problem as a knowledge gap. I indeed think that this is a problem in the training and education uh, of our doctors. Now, um, here's one survey um, saying that uh, about 50% of epileptologists were able to correctly identify drug resistant epilepsy but they're comparing this to other recent surveys, both in Sweden and the state of Michigan, showing that 14 to 18 percent of neurologists were correctly able to identify drug resistant epilepsy. So, again, we're, these numbers are not what they should be. We, we should have a much higher proportion of experts, really, uh, epileptologists and neurologists being able to say, hey, this is treatment resistant epilepsy drug resistant epilepsy and we should refer uh, for surgical referral. You know, I always say, I don't wanna point the finger only at neurologists. Um, I think uh, we as neurosurgeons certainly deserve some of the blame uh, for this problem. First of all, very few, uh, very small proportion of the surgeries that we do in training are epilepsy surgeries. Um, there was a national survey done that shows that out of about 1,500 uh, surgeries done in seven years of training, only about 30 of them were epilepsy surgeries with about 20 craniotomies and about 10 VNS implantations. So again, this is a shockingly low proportion of the surgery that we do. And what it means is that most residents finish seven years of training and they don't really know that much about epilepsy surgery when it's appropriate. You know, I, I, um, was recently involved in training the, the residents at Rutgers, the uh, residency program here in New Jersey. And again, it was not uncommon if you show a, a resident, a chief resident in neurosurgery, an MRI negative epilepsy case, for them to be a little bit clueless about how to proceed. When, when is a PET scan appropriate? When is an ictal spec scan appropriate? How do we work up these patients? And uh, again, we, we uh, the neurosurgery community by and large relies on the epileptology community to give them surgical candidates. But, but again, I'm hoping that with time, the younger neurosurgeons are reversing that paradigm and really trying to become experts in when are the surgeries that they know how to do indicated and appropriate. 
So if I understand this correctly, uh, the typical neurosurgeon during, and so it takes seven years of training to become a neur neurosurgeon is what you're saying approximately, that they will perform about 1,400 surgeries during that time, and only about 30 of those surgeries are epilepsy surgeries? That's right. Yeah. Wow. Wow. Okay. Yeah, and that, that, that actually, uh, I did my residency at Vanderbilt. Um, it's, that's probably pretty uh, on the mark in terms of what I was exposed to. So several temporal lobectomies, several amygdalohippocampectomies. I think I was exposed to one hemispherotomy in training, seven years, one or two, um, and a handful of vagal nerve stimulation. At that time, we weren't doing DBS for epilepsy. At that time, we, we had not started doing uh, neuropace or RNS yet. And so, and so, again, I think that's pretty typical. And I think there are, it, as we identify that this is a problem, I think there are ways that national societies like the AANS can try to, you know, provide additional training to patients, uh, to residents, neurosurgical residents who are at low volume centers. Uh, you know, it, it might mean a, a rotation at a place like, you know, Cleveland Clinic or, or Yale or another place that's doing the high volume of epilepsy surgery so that more surgeons get exposure. Yeah. It, Beyond that, we found that there's only six uh, fellowship programs for epilepsy throughout the country, and this is compared to almost 50 spine fellowships throughout the country. So again, when we uh, queried neurosurgeons on their knowledge of epilepsy surgery questions, we, we didn't have high percentages of correct answers, okay? So again, it, it seems to be a part of neurosurgery that doesn't get enough attention and training. And the surgeons who end up doing a lot of epilepsy surgery, I think, you know, make a point of, of, of making this um, a passion of theirs, a professional passion of theirs, and making this an area of expertise, but a lot of it is self-taught. Mm. So there's also poor coordination of care, and I think it's important to note for a um, medical problem as complex as epilepsy, a lot of our families, their first point of contact might be with a primary care physician, and if they go on to getting surgery, it might be at a level four epilepsy center. And so it's important for there to be communication between these different tiers in, in medicine, but that's not really happening. Um, many epileptologists who see patients at level four centers, a lot of times they don't send these patients back to their primary care physicians. And there's been surveys that show that neurologists and primary care physicians have expressed concern about the negative financial impact of losing patients um, and being afraid to refer out. Hmm. And what that's led to is fewer and fewer complex epilepsy patients being treated at what we call level four uh, epilepsy centers. Um, now, what, what I often say though is even if they're treated at a level four epilepsy centers, epilepsy center, there is a significant amount of variability. Um, so, uh, you know, the NAEC, which uh, gives accreditation to these centers, does not have any requirements regarding annual number of surgeries performed. They, they require that there be a neurosurgeon with five years of experience, but specific training in epilepsy surgery is not required. And so some of these level four centers actually do a relatively low volume of complicated cases. And yet again, I think the onus is on families and patients with epilepsy to be savvy consumers, to ask questions. Uh, if you're going to do a hemispherotomy on my child, um, is, it, is it fine because you're a level four center or, or is that a surgery that you've only done one or two in the last five years? And, and maybe we should send it to a surgeon who does on average, you know, let's say five to ten a year. And yeah. so, so, so I think there are a lot of questions that, that should be asked. Go ahead. I Sorry. I'd like to talk about one case that we know about, uh, and we see this coming up quite a bit, but I only have anecdotes, right? I, I don't have data that I can pull, but if I know that the, the de designation for level four says that for hemispherotomy and for corpus callosotomy, if you don't have the experience at your facility, you're supposed to refer out to another level four that does. I personally don't see that happening a lot. And in fact, we have some families with children. So my son was born with hemimegalencephaly. He required hemispherotomy at three months old. 
we know there are children with hemimegalencephaly at level fours who are being told you have to wait until the child is two years old or 20 plus pounds, which can take a very long time for a baby who's seizing uncontrollably to get to 20 pounds, right? They, can, they can't they can drink from a bottle sure. or not. Um, and the parent is unable to get the referral out to another level four who is willing to take a child and operate on them at that age. And then there's the insurance barrier. The insurance company says, well, why should we refer you out to this level four? You're already at the level four. You have the same designation. Um, and I think it's really right. important for the physician community, the surger, surgeon community to understand these really significant barriers that some of our parents are facing, even with these designations. It's a very good point. Now, beyond, you know, uh, physician uh, knowledge gap, I, I think physician knowledge gap often trickles down into parents' views of epilepsy and patients' views of epilepsy. You know, we continue to view epilepsy as a medical disease and not as a surgical disease. But obviously, once uh, a patient has failed two medicines, what we're basically saying is that they're intractable to medical therapy, that we, we don't have much to offer them anymore in terms of medical therapy. Uh, it doesn't mean they don't need to be on any medicines. Obviously, these patients still require medicine for um, uh, control of their seizures. But to, to cure them with medicine is not a, a likely scenario anymore. We, we should really think of treatment refractory epilepsy is a surgical problem. Um, and what we find it, when we talk to families is uh, we're overestimating the risks of surgery and we're underestimating the risks of lifetime uncontrolled epilepsy. So despite the fact that, you know, very big reviews with thousands of patients have showed a complication rate of about 5% and a death rate of less than 1% with epilepsy surgery, there was one survey of families that showed that over half of them thought that death was a frequent negative outcome from epilepsy surgery. So that's simply not true. And, and I, again, I think it's important to point out that in the scope of surgery that we do as neurosurgeons, epilepsy surgery is well tolerated with a very acceptable side effect profile. And I always tell families who are afraid of surgery or don't want surgery, and I certainly have a number of those patients in my practice, who uh, both the epileptologist and I have offered surgery. There's, in some cases, a clear lesion, and, and we think there'd be a very good outcome, uh, you know, maybe 80 to 90% seizure freedom with surgery, and, and families don't want that. You know, I think it's important to communicate with those families that you're, you're, you're making a choice by not operating, just like you're making a choice by moving forward with surgery. And the yeah. choice of not operating can sometimes have just a significant impact on, on your child's quality of life and outcome. Yeah. That's Go ahead, sure. No, I'm just nodding my head. Yes. I mean, we we tell them you're at a crossroads and you you have to decide if you don't do surgery, this is what will likely happen. And again, especially for these infants or babies that have drug resistant seizures, you're really looking at uh, you're not going to attain developmental milestones or they're going to regress. Um, I know my son in between two surgeries lost the ability to speak and he's never spoken to me again. And I was afraid to do an, an additional procedure. You know, we didn't want to have to do it again. And during that time, he lost all his spoken words and has never been able to speak to me again. And I, if I could go back, I wish I had not been afraid, but even I was afraid and I'm pretty deep in this world. So this is, this is something we have to work on is this parental barrier as well. Yeah. Well, thanks for sharing that. So again, one of the things that I've encountered in maybe the last 40 <laughs> patients that I've operated on here in New Jersey is that many of them tell me that, um, that they've dealt with a neurologist or, or another doctor who's dismissed surgery or actively discourage them from, from moving forward with surgery. And um, in many times that care, care provider is their neurologist. And, and that's a big problem because we do know that families um, place a great deal of trust in their neurologist. And if the neurologist tells them, hey, don't speak to a surgeon, surgery is not an option for you, surgery is gonna lead to a bad outcome for you, um, then they, they take that to heart and it's very hard then 
if I encounter these patients to try to, uh, I want to say sell them on surgery because I, I sometimes feel like my, my job is a little bit of that, trying to, um, trying to uh, highlight the benefits of what surgery can offer them. So I do think more and more the solution to this is uh, physicians approaching this from a multidisciplinary concept. And, and I think the multidisciplinary concept should include not only neurologists and neurosurgeons who can discuss the pros and cons of surgery together, but also probably a neuropsychologist. There are some uh, guidelines from the American Academy of Neurology that a patient with drug refractor epilepsy should probably be undergoing annual neuropsychological testing. Yes. And I think this is yet another way to convince a family that says, you know what, we don't want surgery right now. Well, the, the problem is, as, as Monica, as you mentioned, you're at a crossroads and you're going to move forward in, in one direction. And no matter how you move forward, it has implications for your child. And what we see in a lot of these children with repeated seizures and drug-resistant epilepsy who don't get surgery is each year we see a decrement in their neuropsychological testing. And sometimes that data is important enough to convince families to say, okay, we don't like the idea of surgery, we're nervous about surgery, but we see that not doing surgery is leading to problems for our child that we can measure and we can, we can see, and that's quite compelling. Yes. Yeah. You know, just like every other health problem in the United States uh, and globally, I think there's been reports about this from, you know, subarachnoid and hemorrhage to, uh, you know, uh, to stroke, to, to a number of different um, disease entities. Epilepsy is affected by barriers that surround, uh, that, 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 uh, have to do with socioeconomic status, that have to do with insurance, um, that have to do with race and culture. And so I think this is just something that we all have to be aware of. Um, we, we do know that actually epilepsy is more common in low-income communities. And so I think it's something that we have to, you know, I, one of the cities that I work in here in um, New Jersey is Newark, New Jersey, and, and indeed we see a staggering high rate of very complex treatment of refractory epilepsy, and this is precisely in a community that is mostly Medicaid, does not have private insurance, and has uh, additional barriers to getting the epilepsy surgery and the pre-surgical studies that they need. Yeah. The other, uh, one of the other big barriers to moving forward with surgery is that epilepsy surgery is complex. And the pre-surgical evaluation can be very onerous and time consuming. So for example, I mentioned MRI negative epilepsy uh, as being an important um, category because a lot of times these patients don't get operations even when it might be appropriate. Patients with MRI negative epilepsy might have to get a PET scan. Most of our patients who are children have to get a sedated PET scan. They might get an ictal spec scan that requires another hospitalization capturing a seizure. They might need a MEG scan. We have um, MEG, there's about 15 to 20 MEGs in clinical practice, uh, in clinical usage throughout the country. And we do have one in New Jersey but that requires going to another hospital, getting another insurance authorization. Right. Um, you might get discussed in epilepsy conference once or twice. Um, you might, they might want to get an fMRI or a WADA study, and, and all this takes time. And so I, I tell my patients the first time I meet them, when I recognize that they might be a surgical candidate, I tell them, listen, I'm gonna give you my cell phone number, I'm gonna give you my email, and I'm gonna ask you for patience because this is a long process. It may take several months before we get you to surgery. But again, I'm committed to working through that and, and I need your patience because again, I think this long, complex process it leads to patient attrition uh, and, and patients get sick of all these studies and uh, sometimes they fall through the cracks. And so I think it's important to really, any serious epilepsy center needs to have an epilepsy coordinator, somebody who's keeping track of these patients and, and helping them through this relatively complex process. We looked, um, this is unpublished data, but we got an IRB at Rutgers and we looked at 250 patients who had come to our multidisciplinary epilepsy center. 
And what we found is that 90%, almost 90% of the patients were either MRI negative or had multifocal changes on their MRI. And why that's significant is because you generally cannot take a patient like that to the OR just on the basis of MRI and EEG, which are the two sort of cornerstone uh, diagnostic um, uh, tests for patients with epilepsy. But what we found is that the utilization of PET, INSPECT, and MEG in neuropsych was very low in this population. And a lot of this is because of resource uh, in, in, the, in the low income area like Newark. So again, it's, it's a difficult problem, but we have to, I, I do think that the underutilization of these studies uh, are, is part of the bigger underutilization problem. And it's something that really needs to be addressed. They're not going the extra step. The, the clinician that's working with the family is not saying, all right, MRI negative, let's, let's keep digging. As you said earlier, they're just stopping the evaluation at that point. And, and I can tell you that for sure, we see that happening a lot. A parent will come into a social media group and say, oh, we're, we, they can't see anything on the MRI. And especially, you know, again, I'm going back to the babies, that cortical dysplasia can hide on MRI for years. So you have a kid with infantile spasms, the, the radiology team doesn't see cortical dysplasia and they say they're not a surgical candidate. Well, you gotta you gotta dig deeper, or you you've got to go to a team that has a better machine, and and exactly. you know, on a one and a half T, but they're on a three T. All of these layers that these parents have to navigate, it's so complicated, so complicated. It's exactly right, and you know you mentioned cortical dysplasia. Cortical dysplasia, of course, is the most common cause of focal epilepsy in children. The most common cause, and so. And here we have a common cause that sometimes you can see on MRI and sometimes you can't. Uh, PET is an important study for cortical dysplasia, uh, ictal spect, um, MEG, electric source imaging, fMRI, EEG. The, the list of other studies you can do to try to sort out, uh, is there a lesion there or is there an area of the brain that we can at least focus on to put grids on, for example, are quite exhaustive. And so I, I think the message to parents is if you're running into a wall, keep looking, find somebody else, get a second opinion. You know, I mean, again, somebody like you, Monica, obviously you, you've read enough about this where, where you know a tremendous amount about it. But I, I think, you know, for most parents, it's a matter of finding an individual who really knows their stuff and, and recognizing that, um, that it's, it's, it might be a, a bit of a search. So in Switzerland, they actually started doing this quadrimodal imaging in one setting. And this is quite attractive because rather than, okay, you have one appointment at one place to get an EEG, and then they send you for a three Tesla MRI after you got your 1.5 Tesla MRI, and then they send you to another place for a PET scan, and then they send you to another place. They basically got a lot of these studies all in one. And again, th this is much better for patients. It's much better to, this is an example of us streamlining the pre-surgical workup. And again, I would argue that any patient, any patient with focal epilepsy and many patients, especially children with generalized epilepsy, if they have a negative MRI, they should probably get a PET scan, period. It should be, you know, part automatic. of the process. Yeah, automatic. Yeah. Automatic, yeah. And, you know, one last thing that we saw in looking at our literature search is that research for epilepsy surgery is really underfunded. Now, again, pharma companies that have a lot of money are able to spend a lot of money on testing a new anti-epileptic drug, even though I mentioned that there hasn't been a single drug that's come out in the last three decades that's really moved the dial on the rate of treatment of refractory epilepsy. It's true that the new drugs have better side effect profiles, but they're generally not more effective than drugs that were created, you know, 20, 30 years ago. And so, but, but, you know, it, there's also a lot of money in things like VNS. You know, I, you know, I live in New Jersey. There was a time when, you know, in the COVID time, I don't go to New York that much anymore, but uh, there was a time when you, you couldn't walk around Manhattan without seeing an ad for VNS. And I think, it, again, it's because it's a device. Uh, and so if there's a device, there's money to be made by selling that device, well, then there's money in marketing. But surgery is sort of has this non-proprietary nature to it. 
And, and so we, we don't get as much funding into research and, and hopefully groups like yours, Monica, you know, shed light on this problem and, and do some of the advocacy work that I think is really important to change, uh, you know, national priorities when it comes to allocation of research funds. We were part of the epilepsy benchmark work group. In fact, my son's story was the uh, patient story for the area four benchmark that was uh, just published by in in epilepsy, not in epilepsy, in epilepsy currents. So the NINDS is asking for commentary. It actually just closed on October 30th, and I cited one of your papers, and I asked, I said, you know, the the uh, surgery is not being funded in the same way that treatments are being funded by NINDS. It needs its own benchmark rather than being buried in the other research benchmarks. Um, and, and to the parents out there, if you go to our blog post about what the epilepsy benchmarks are, you can read it there. But we asked for epilepsy surgery to have its own benchmark because I don't think that the federal government is going to see it as a treatment that needs its own specific funding if it's you know kind of buried in the other benchmarks. So I'm crossing my fingers that at the uh, curing the epilepsies meeting in January that they say, hey, maybe she's right. It does need to be its own benchmark. And then that'll draw more attention to funding there. We'll see. Great. Well, thanks. Thanks for doing that work. So just to end on, uh, you know, a more optimistic and positive note, how can we reverse these trends that, that are leading to underutilization? Again, I do think the knowledge gap is probably the primary trend. And I think this really requires, um, uh, you know, advocacy to change things uh, about the training system, both for neurologists and neurosurgeons. I will tell you one optimistic note that they've, they've done studies of, you know, medical students and neurologists who have recently finished training as compared to neurologists who finished training, let's say, two, two decades ago. And they found that the more recent graduates have a more positive outlook on the possibility of surgery for epilepsy. And so I think minds are changing. Uh, I think this is a cultural change. It takes time. And um, uh, I, I think little by little things are moving in the right direction. But I, I do think we need at the national level some um, reform in how we uh, you know, teach epilepsy to our residents. Um, I think the other thing that can help the knowledge gap is to establish institutional guidelines and evidence-based algorithms for surgical candidacy. So, you know, I told you before about chest pain. Uh, obviously, epilepsy is much more complicated, okay? I recognize that, but I do think by subdividing epilepsy into different categories, um, we can provide, you know, flow charts and algorithms for surgical candidacy. And I'll show you a little bit uh, what's been done before and some of what we've worked on for hemispherotomy in particular. For appropriate surgical referrals, again, if you or a loved one has drug resistant epilepsy, and again, if you've been on two or three meds and you've had epilepsy for more than a year, uh, then, then you, you probably qualify as somebody with drug resistant epilepsy. You, you need to be a savvy consumer and you need to tell your epileptologist, I want to speak to a surgeon who knows something about epilepsy. Because again, I think that one of the things that I see again and again is um, an epileptologist who doesn't do craniotomies for a living doesn't speak to it, uh, doesn't speak about it, can't answer the questions in a way that uh, a neurosurgeon who does it day in, day out can. And so I, I think it's really important if you want to know about a craniotomy for epilepsy, speak to somebody who does craniotomy for epilepsy, and that's a surgeon. And, and again, if you're drug resistant, uh, both the American Academy of Neurology and uh, internationally against epilepsy say that you should get a surgical referral. Um, I think more and more we need to empower patients. Uh, we need to empower patients and physicians who are dealing with patients with epilepsy. Toolsforepilepsy.com is an interesting website. You can see there's a number of websites like it, which try to answer, uh, have, have a physician or a patient answer a few questions about their epilepsy, and then tries to give you a grade of what your suitability for surgery might be. Again, it's an imperfect tool, but I think it's a sign that with such a low rate of utilization, we're looking to, for other ways to reach out to patients um, to, you know, uh, spread the word about surgery. And then finally, 
establish institutional guidelines for the appropriateness of imaging and think of ideas for how to streamline the pre-surgical evaluation. I spoke about that a little bit before. This is what some of the algorithms of care look like for epilepsy surgery decision pathways. So relatively straightforward, if you're drug resistant, you fail two drugs, you either have focal or generalized epilepsy. Uh, thankfully, the uh, classification scheme has been simplified in a very nice way. If you have focal epilepsy, you either have lesional epilepsy or it's non-lesional. And if it's non-lesional, you should be getting these other studies. And again, I won't go through the whole guideline, but this is the way that we should be thinking about it in a very uh, algorithmic fashion. And we recently published this report for epilepsy, along with some of my colleagues at Vanderbilt, um, to try to look at you know, uh, a, a guideline for patients who might be candidates for hemispherotomy. You know, again, I, I mentioned I've been in a bunch of epilepsy conferences throughout New Jersey where patients had bilateral EEG and they said, well, they're not a candidate for hemispherotomy. Well, that's just not true. That's not true. And there's a lot of data that shows that those patients should not be denied an appropriate surgery. And, and again, I think, you know, that's part of the reason we wrote this article is to try to get the word out, especially for our neurology colleagues. You know, I thought a lot about this problem from a philosophical point of view of why, um, why is there this problem? And I think, you know, we as society, we, we look at sins of omission, not doing something as different from sins of commission, committing a, a, a sin, committing a, a problem, a crime. You know, in, in philosophers have looked at this classic, you know, uh, railroad uh, dilemma. If a, a conductor's fallen asleep and a train's about to run over two people who are on the track, but you're sitting in the, in the uh, switch control board and you have the ability to switch the train onto a new track where it would kill just a single person, would you do it? And it's interesting that anybody should even hesitate, right? But we all do. We hesitate because the idea of doing a sin of commission, pulling that switchboard and killing somebody, uh, you know, is repulsive to us. It should be. But again, from a utilitarian standpoint, obviously we would prefer one death as opposed to two. Now, I, I bring all this up because I think I, I see something similar happening in the epilepsy world. I see both neurologists who maybe have had a bad experience with surgery in the past or simply are skeptical of surgery. And I see families who are nervous about picking surgery for their children often go the omission route. They say, you know, maybe, maybe you know, there will be problems down the road from not doing surgery, but somehow that sits better with me than doing the surgery and risking uh, a possibility of something going wrong. But again, I really think that, that this is a wrong-headed uh, uh, philosophy. I think it's dangerous for our patients. And fortunately, I can tell you, uh, I'll just tell you one last anecdote. Last month, I did two posterior quadrant disconnections both on uh, people, uh, both on uh, children with infantile spasms, okay? But the, the only difference is one of those patients was an infant, 18 months old, had only been having seizures for uh, about uh, 11 months, and the other patient was 20, okay, 20 years old. And the damage that repeated daily seizures had done to that 20-year-old uh, I can't fix that anymore. I can stop the seizures, but I can't fix the uh, severe damage of years of uncontrolled epilepsy. Uh, but for that infant, we really have a chance of having a tremendously good outcome by stopping those seizures early in life and allowing that child to live through those critical years of psychosocial development without seizures. And so again, I, I bring that anecdote up to explain why I think uh, the fear of uh, sin of commission and opting for these omission strategies is really a problem in the epilepsy world. And I'll just end with this last slide. I, again, I, I want to thank you, Monica, for what you're doing. Um, and I want to, you know, uh, open up my own email and, and information. Uh, again, I, I've made it basically the, um, the, the passion of my career to treat patients with epilepsy. I see the great impact we can have on patients' lives. And uh, again, I think it's, it's important to provide good information to families. So I do want to um, open up my own email. If you have questions, uh, you know, uh, whether or not you live in the New Jersey area, if you have, if, if 
you have questions, please feel free to reach out and I'll, I'll be happy to answer them. Well, that's very, very nice of you. Um, thank you for doing that. We'd love to have you back for some subsequent webinars. Uh, sure. Part two of this series is uh, going to be specifically about the, the patient journey. We've got another doctor coming on with some of our uh, family members to talk about how excruciating it is to get to surgery, all of the different barriers that are up for in pediatrics in particular. But I would love to have you back to maybe talk about hemispherotomy with a few other surgeons and maybe some other surgeries as well. I, I hope we've hooked you. Our community is wonderful. These are terrific kids, terrific parents. Um, hopefully we'll be able to do our live family conference after this pandemic is over. And I would really love to have you there because um, you're gonna meet hundreds of children that have had surgery all in one place, having a, a great time with their parents as well. Great. Well, thank you. Thank you again so much, Monica. Appreciate right. it. Thank you so much.